shares for his majesty the king. Hip, hip. And so the balcony party go back inside St. James's Palace through the opening that has been created for them by literally removing the window, Robert Hartman. That was, that was quite a moment, wasn't it? That, that really was. I mean, there we had the Garter King of Arms um, doing what Garter King of Arms has done for centuries. We just saw a, 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 a piece of British Army drill you very rarely see of the, uh, the Coldstream Guards there doing a, a remove headdress and three cheers um, while armed. I mean, sometimes you see that on, 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 on parades without, uh, without uh, weapons, but um, beautifully done. Uh, and I thought what was so telling there was the way this, this event is echoing beyond these ancient walls. You could hear the crowds out in the manor, many of whom will be following this on, on their phones and on TV and radio, and, and, and the, the, the cheers echoing. It wasn't just three cheers here in, in, uh, in, in St. James's Palace. Um, but I think everyone is just thrilled, really, to be seeing and taking part in something that hitherto was, was off limits, except to a handful of very elderly men. And very moving for you, Elizabeth Buchanan, I know you worked so closely with the then Prince Charles. I could tell, watching you in the studio here at that moment, uh, it was quite a moment for you personally as well to see your old boss. <laughs> it, is, it is an extraordinary moment. The proclaimed king. After, after the, uh, his extraordinary decades serving this nation as Prince of Wales, now to assume the role of king. And what also struck me, uh, looking at the crowds there, the different age groups that are there, and, and the solemnity of this moment also combined the very personal nature, the things that he is speaking about, about his mother, about his wife, about his sister, his brothers, and this is something about the Prince of Wales. He is able to operate at an Olympian height, often a global, he's talking about climate change, his big issues of the day, and yet he's also focused on people and individuals, and I can remember an event when we were in Wales once, I think it was at the time of Prince William's 21st birthday, and we did a, a, a tour up there, and he met a lady in, in the crowd who had just been diagnosed with cancer, and he summoned me over and he said, Elizabeth, please, this is Mrs. Jones. I've changed her name. Please, can you make sure that she receives help from the Bristol Cancer Help Centre, which is one of its patronages, to go alongside her, her very intensive therapy. I did all that. Two weeks later, he's about to make a speech in the European Parliament. I'm drafting that speech. It's late at night. The phone rings. Elizabeth, yes, Your Royal Highness. How is Mrs. Jones? Well, I'm going, I'm writing a speech for the European Parliament. He wanted to know how Mrs. Jones was. He has an elephantine memory. He has an elephantine memory, which is uh, before the poor private secretaries. Now, just as all that was happening, there were also more uh, gun salutes. There were 96 rounds fired yesterday following the death of the Queen. But this, uh, these were the ones that were fired yesterday in London and at saluting stations around the world, indeed. And then... Today, the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery began firing their guns to mark the accession of His Majesty the King. At the moment that that principal proclamation began, the King's Troops firing 41 guns in Hyde Park. The Honourable Artillery Company fired 62 guns at the Tower of London. So that all happening at the same time at 11 o'clock as the proclamation, the principal pro proclamation was read out there at St James's Palace, Edinburgh, as you can see there, Edinburgh Castle, um, where those guns were 
also fired. It was extraordinary, Robert Howard, watching that as well and hearing the crowd and hearing the God save the king. It is still very strange to hear, isn't it? Because it's something that you hear in archive, in black and white films, in you know, something for 70 years we have not heard. And here we are, less than two days after the Queen's death, and, and it has changed. It's, it's changing and we are getting used to it. It'll still take some getting used to, obviously, things like the coinage and the stamps and the banknotes, that's all to come. But it, it just underpins the, 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 the swiftness of, of transition. The fact that we just go from rain to rain without a, without a breath. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I think today what we saw was that the, the way that the, 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 the king wants to, wants to affect that change, um, you know, as swiftly as possible. I mean, monarchy is all about continuity but but you know we, we we're coming to terms with it there was the same sense actually when the queen came to the throne in 1952 winston churchill then prime minister he, he described his thrill he said i who took my first military commission under queen victoria you know i rejoice in saying once again god save the queen they find it quite extraordinary saying god save the queen back in the 50s it took a while to get used to people kept talking about the king sorry the queen um and and the same will happen now um, uh, we will not say God save the Queen for probably at least another century, given the line of succession. Um, we'll get used to it soon enough. But uh, but but it, it, it just shows, as I say, the, the the way in which continuity is all. We we have so much instability in the world. The last thing we need is any any uh, dithering when it comes to our monarchy. Well, let's go into St James's Palace now. Clive is there. He witnessed obviously the proclamation from the balcony at St James's Palace and joins us now, Clive. Yeah, hi there, Sophie. Um, an ancient ceremony inside the building, just over there, but out here it was all about selfie sticks and mobile phones. And there's about a thousand people here, and as soon as the trumpeters came out on the balcony, just before the proclamation, a huge ooh went right through the crowd. Everyone ready for that proclamation of a new king. And I have to say, I got my phone out too as along with everybody else, including Sarah Bradley, who's with me. Sarah, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Why was it important for you to be here today? I think yesterday, um, I spent the whole of the day in front of the television, mourning the loss of an amazing head of our monarchy, and you know, seven decades of um, her loyalty to us was incredibly moving. So today, I really felt I wanted to come and be a part of this momentous day, part of history really. Mm. And your thoughts on the new king and the challenges that he faces perhaps? I think he is going to be an incredible king. I think he has planned for this day for the whole of his life and I think he has such support around him. I think the Queen Consort Camilla is going to be um, a wonderful right hand lady supporting him and you know and also William is there for him and um, he's got a lot of challenges ahead of him and I think he doesn't underestimate that for one minute. Um, I think he'll take it all in his stride and I think he would just be incredible. Okay, Sarah, thank you. Um, important to remember, I'm not sure what the alchemy is exactly, when um, was Prince Charles uh, suddenly became king on the death of his mother. Um, the coronation at some point will happen. That is mainly a religious ceremony, but this is the public declaration of the fact that he's king. So, I thank you. And a lot of focus, obviously, on the new king this morning, but we've also seen the Queen Consort, and it is going to change his life dramatically. It will also change Camilla's life dramatically. How do you think she will deal with that change? She'll do it quite beautifully. Uh, it's extraordinary. They've been married for 17 years, um, and the Queen Consort came from a very normal background, and she's stepped up and into this role with extraordinary grace and dignity. Because it's not been an easy... It has not been easy for her, and it's all members of the royal family. Times are tough sometimes, they put their head down and they just get on with it. And she did that. It took courage. It really took courage and she did it beautifully. And now they are such a joyful couple together and it's wonderful. They need each other. You look back at monarchs of the past. George VI had Queen Elizabeth as we were the Queen Mother and the Queen had the Duke of Edinburgh. And we now have this remarkable person who will sit alongside in partnership with and they laugh together they can see the silly things that happen they love nothing more than silly things going a bit wrong it just gives an opportunity to laugh and let your hair down at the end of the day 
and they are a wonderful partnership and a wonderful team and the burdens will be heavy for both of them and they will need each other and they also of course then now have the new Prince of Wales um, and the Princess of Wales who will be equally supportive. It's a wonderful and strong family unit and connection and we are secure in the future. What a lucky country we are. He stressed, the new king has stressed on the two occasions we've heard him speak, he's spoken specifically about his wife, hasn't he, and about his, his need for her to be there alongside him. It will be a difficult challenge for her as well, though, won't it? It, it certainly will. I think it was so important that on her uh, on accession day this year, on the anniversary of the Queen coming to the throne, she issued that statement, a very important statement, in which she said, it's my sincere wish uh, that, uh, that Camilla should become Queen Consort. Up until that point, she was going to be called Princess Consort. And, and as Elizabeth said, uh, you know, the Queen understood the importance of having someone really solid at your side in these difficult moments. She saw how important her mother was to her father. She fully understood how, and said on many occasions, how important Prince Philip was to her. You know, to have a successful monarch, you've really got to have a partnership. And so the Queen could see the importance of that and the importance that she should, that, that her daughter-in-law should be Queen. And she said it, and it was remarkable how it was just done there and then. It was a sincere wish of the Queen on her accession day. And, and, and now, you know, the Queen Consort is the Queen Consort and we will start calling her Her Majesty. But unlike Charles, she has not been born into this. And she is a very private person. She's, she has been for a long time and she's certainly... She's kept her, her place apart as well, hasn't she? She's needed her own space, which presumably will will, will shrink a lot now. She's, it, she's much more in the public eye. It will shrink. It will shrink. Um, but she it, it's, it's a partnership. She's developed her own extraordinary interest. She's done an enormous amount of good on domestic violence, on reading, really important issues that she has dragged from the fringes into the mainstream of public life. And that is terribly important. And therefore, together, they will be such a powerful force for good. They have been, and they will continue to be. And she will bear this burden incredibly well. It is a burden, but she will bear it well. And 17 years of preparation. She knew this was coming in some form or other. And it is so right that she is now Her Majesty, the Queen Consort. So now the proceedings move away from St. James's Palace. We won't see the royal couple again, I think, today. They have plenty of meetings though ahead, don't they, uh, at Buckingham Palace? Well, yes, and, and, and I think, again, we may get an indication of the, 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 the different nature of this new reign because the king this afternoon at the palace, he meets the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Prime Minister of the Cabinet, and, and the opposition as well. Uh, and, and we understand that the, the footage of those meetings will be made available, and that did not happen in 1952. So we are seeing all the time, just gradually, there is a, a, a just a, a slightly different way of doing this. And as, as, as the King said in his declaration, he absolutely intends to follow his irreplaceable mother's example. But that doesn't mean you can't sort of uh, do it in a different way. And, we're going to see that. In the meantime, we have more proclamations because it began this morning, the principal proclamation at St James's Palace. That will now move uh, to the City of London. So we saw before the Lord Mayor of London and his uh, City Civic Party who uh, were there at part one of the Accession Council this morning. They have all now travelled to Mansion House, which is the Lord Mayor's residence, his official residence and also, also his place of work. And shortly, they will process across to the Royal Exchange, a very short distance in the heart of the City of London. And that is where the next proclamation is going to be made, and that is at 12 o'clock. Sonali Shah is there for us now, and she can explain it all. Sonali. 